welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for the next hour of Good Gardening. You can get in touch with us by dialing 1-800-676-5446. Our phone volunteers will be happy to help you. We do love to get your pictures and your emails, so send us what you have to byf at unl.edu. As always, we do need to know where you live. Give us as much information as you can about your question. Backyard Farmer is also available on our YouTube page as well as on Facebook. So let's start with some questions. And Kate, you get the first ones. Uh, you have two pictures on this one. This comes to us from Rockport, Missouri. He says he keeps finding these worm-like insects around the outside and the inside of the house. They're about a quarter of an inch to a half inch long. He wants to know what they are and how we get rid of them. Sure, these are really, really common household pests. They're called carpet beetle larvae, and they feed on all sorts of stuff. It can be dried goods, dried food, animal fur, rugs, carpets, fabrics. That's why we see them indoors a lot. If you're seeing them indoors and outdoors, I would check for an infestation source, maybe a bird's nest, and get rid of it if you can. Otherwise, for inside, the key is to vacuum, vacuum, vacuum. <laughs> okay. You're, uh, you have one picture on the next one. This one comes to us from Arthur in western Nebraska. He said uh, these little flying bugs showed up in the thousands. They're very active. Um, they're about four to five millimeters in length. He also wants an identification and wants to know how to control them. Sure. This one has a really great name. It's called a dirt-colored seed bug. Um, and they overwinter in cracks and crevices and in leaf litter too. So it could be that they're just all coming out in mass. There could also be a host plant nearby that they were all feeding on. Um, this particular species, I don't know what that host plant is, but I suspect that it's probably just a seasonal thing or going to happen pretty quickly. So you can wait it out. Um, otherwise, just be sure to seal up your house so they don't get indoors. All right, thank you very much. Rock, you have uh, two pictures for this question. This comes to us from Seward. Is this a weed? If so, what is it and how to kill it dead? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a weed. It's a thistle, probably a bowler, a spare thistle, um, or, but anyway, regardless, these are biennials. Um, so right now it's in its bolt stage. So last year it was down and close and prostrate to the ground. Then it's gonna bolt. You wanna cut off the seed before it heads. So you wanna clip those back right now. Um, there really is no selective measures, especially in a, in a garden bed like that. So you're gonna have to either spot spray with Roundup or they can be dug up. All right, and uh, we don't know which, whether it's the native one or not. No, and if it was the native ones, they have some positive characteristics, but I, I think on the thistle side, we tend to err on the let's get rid of them. All right, thanks, Rock. Lauren, uh, you have three pictures, all of which are the same thing from different people. <laughs> the first one is this one, which he thinks is a slime mold out of a lilac bush. Uh, turned into this heart-shaped thing. He's from Council Bluffs. He uh, just thinks it's gorgeous. The second one comes to us from Lincoln, found it under a backyard bird feeder after sowing mini clover, and he thinks it's associated with the clover. And the third one is, what is growing in the flower bed? Does it need to be removed? They are here in Lincoln. <laughs> These are all different types of slime molds, and um, they're, they're really fascinating organisms. Uh, they come in all different colors. The most common uh, we see is a white one. Uh, we'll see even bright yellow, the pink color, uh, just a range of those. Usually they'll, they'll dry out and become kind of crusty like you saw in the last picture. Uh, and, and with those, they're really not hurting anything. Uh, they're just existing on the saprophytic, as a saprophyte there on the material. You tend to see them repeatedly in the same area. So you can just simply take a hose and wash them away. Um, the bird seed observation, um, it, it could have been brought in with something uh, but it could have as easily been brought in with the birds or something else. So probably not the clover seed. But All right, anyway, and, and you're not going not. to eat them? No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna recommend that. All right, Elizabeth, you have uh, one picture, one question on this round. Uh, this is a Lincoln viewer and he wants ID. He, uh, he, he, it, it's been here since he bought the home. It's so colorful this year, he wonders 
What is this exactly? <laughs> I don't have a simple answer for this viewer because he has three or four or five different plant material all mixed together. So first we have the blooming wagelia um, that has the purple flowers on it. And then we have uh, the winter creeper, uh, the euonymus. So there's a variegated kind in there, there's a green kind in there, and then there's also a handful of um, volunteer trees as well. Um, in terms of how you would care for it, um, to be very honest with you, I would just take care of the tree seedlings and leave the rest of it to kind of commingle and grow together like it's been doing, because it's gorgeous and beautiful and full. <laughs> it was. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, we have a real treat for our first feature tonight. David Holding has what might seem like an ordinary pond in his backyard. In reality, it uses a very special filtration system that sets it apart. Let's take a few minutes to hear from David about his bog filter on his pond. Understanding the difference between determinate and indeterminate tomatoes is important when you're choosing plants or when you're managing plants in the garden. Determinate plants grow as a bush and um, oftentimes you'll find cultivars with that, that word in their name. Bush tomato or patio tomato, celebrity, Rutgers, all very common de determinate tomatoes. They grow to a set height, usually between three to five feet and um, very, very minimal branching and they produce their crops in one large flush, which may last for two or three weeks. Determinate tomatoes are great if you want to have a lot of tomatoes on hand for processing or to freeze. If you want to make salsa or spaghetti sauce, determinate tomatoes are a great choice. If you want tomatoes throughout the growing season, you're going to need to make successive plantings so that you have more tomatoes to harvest later in the season. Indeterminate tomatoes grow as a long vine. And that vine continues to grow all summer long until it, it dies in the fall from frost. Determinate tomatoes continue to set fruits, new fruits, throughout the summer. So you have a smaller harvest, but they're extended throughout the growing season. Common varieties of indeterminate tomatoes would include Brandywine, Cherokee Purple, Sun Gold, uh, and many others. So choose the right tomato for your garden. If you have limited space, a determinate type of tomato would probably be the best choice. If you have a good structure for your tomato to grow on, then go for the indeterminate. We did a little bit of a goof. We reversed our segments, so you got to see tomatoes and you'll get to see the bog garden on our next one. So thanks to Sarah for giving us all that information about those tomatoes. So we're going to get to more of your questions after the break, but before that, let's hear from Gannon Rush of UNL's High Plains Regional Climate Center with this week's perfect weather outlook. Thanks, Kim. It should be another great week with perfect temperatures. On Friday, temperatures will be in the 90s out west and 80s across the majority of the state, which is perfect for sitting by the pool. After that, things will cool off on Saturday and go into the 70s, and will stay that way for the majority of the week. There is a chance of the heat returning on Wednesday, however. Outside of the chance of storms on Friday, this week will be spotty. The heaviest precipitation is expected in the central and southeastern parts of the state. The bulk of this will occur on Friday into Saturday, when storms will form in the north central part of the state and move to the southeast. The biggest story this year has been in the improvements to drought conditions in Nebraska. Outside of a small strip in the Lincoln area, which should see improvements here in the coming weeks, the state is in phenomenal shape. The springtime rainfall has been tremendous and helped improve conditions to the point where Nebraska is at its lowest percentage of drought in the past four years. And that's your week of weather forecast. Back to you, Kim. Thanks, Gannon. All right, let's get back to answering some questions. Do our little rain dance if we need it. Um, let's see, Kate, you have two, two pictures on this first one. This comes to us from Harlan, Iowa. She uh, was told she should try to identify the bugs eating her plants. She went out and took pictures. Um, she's, she's wondering, and she's wondering then, is seven safe? And what do we think here? Sure. Well, I wasn't able to see any of the actual insects in this picture. So if you don't mind doing a little bit more investigating, maybe turn the leaves over, see if you can find what the culprit is. Um, knowing what you're dealing with is a really great first step into knowing how to manage it. Seven is a great product. Just be sure that you're reading the label to make sure it works on the plant that you have. But once again, the insect that you're targeting is also going to be on the label. So be sure to do that first. 
And you want to make sure seven is used at the right time of day for your favorite insects, is that right? The pollinators? Oh yes, for the pollinators. So be sure to do it. <laughs> yes, thank you. I was like, what's my favorite insect? Um, be sure to do it in the evening or in, try to avoid any flowering blooms too. All right, thank you, Kate. You have uh, one picture on the next one. In all the years I've been hosting, I have never seen this. So this is really cool. It, it's a Syracuse viewer. Uh, gooseberries started to get a rough surface on the berry, then it turns to spots that look like needle pricks, then a worm eats the berry, then webs make the, rot the berry rotten, and then he sees small mites. She's wondering, should she spray for a pest before they bloom and set fruit, or is this a disease? So there's a couple of different things going on here, and the first one is really cool, just like him. I had not known about this or not looked into it before. But what's causing the fruit, what's eating it, are gooseberry maggots. So the fly will actually lay the egg right underneath the skin of the fruit. The maggots hatch, they burrow into the fruit, and then eventually just eat it from the inside out. So there's a couple different things you can do. First and foremost is any infested fruit, pick them and destroy them so you don't have the same issue next year. Um, another really interesting tactic is about this time of year or into mid-June, you can take a tarp and actually put it under the gooseberry plant because as the flies develop, they're going to pupate and try to go down into the soil so you can stop their life cycle right there. As far as treating with a pesticide, we're kind of past that point in time this year. April and May is probably the best and you need to make sure you choose something that's labeled for gooseberry and you're gonna wanna treat after flowering is done when those fruits start to set in. All right, so that'll be interesting, really interesting mm -hmm. to follow. All right, thank you, Kate. Rock, you have uh, two pictures on this first one. This is a lawn at Lake Wakanda, which is Union, Nebraska. Would probably apply anywhere. He's, his question is, can clover and turf grass peacefully coexist in a lawn or will the clover want to take over? He would like to keep the clover for the pollinators, but he also principally wants turf grass. I understand, and that's a great question, but you know, prior to the 1950s, all grass seed mixes had white clover in them. This is white clover in this particular picture, and it's very common because they fix nitrogen. They're a legume, they fix nitrogen, and that would provide the nitrogen needed by the lawn. When we see clover dominating a lawn, the lawn is usually under-fertilized. When we see uh, lawns that are dominated by turf, then they're usually fertilized adequately or maybe even excessively. So you can play a little balancing act with nitrogen fertilizer and shift the population one way or the other. If you want less clover, put on more nitrogen within the limits of what we recommend on our on the website, nothing more than two to three pounds a year. And when you want, if you want to shift it more to the pollinator species, um, limit the nitrogen because white clover will proliferate in those. So yes, they can live together. Awesome, excellent. You have uh, two pictures on the next one also. This is, um, he's wondering what this is and how to get rid of it. He's, he sent a number of pictures early on and we kind of had some back and forth on, does this land in your lap, Lauren's lap, or Dennis's lap, or all three of them? Well, this is, I think this is more Lauren's powdery mildew, but I, I'm gonna <laughs> go ahead and answer it um, because there's some management stuff that goes along with it, so if you don't mind, and if you want to chime in after this, but this is powdery mildew. It's a it's a fungal a pathogen. It's not really harmful. I mean, it it makes it look ugly. And in this one picture here that you see on the screen right now, what's intriguing is there's fescue in that picture, and it's not affected by the powdery mildew, so it's more resistant than the Kentucky bluegrass that's there. So even overseeding with some more fescue would would make this less susceptible. the The other thing is is that there are no fungicidal recommendations for um, powdery mildew. We wouldn't recommend it. It goes away on its own. But there could be some surface moisture issues with this, and we often see it more in the shade. So if it's more in the shade, maybe that's where turf shouldn't be growing, or maybe it's a little too close to the shade. Even if it's in full sun, though, um, sometimes just the moisture at the surface and no, no free water on the leaves will make it proliferate. So maybe a little bit of uh, air movement, um, something else, you know, mow frequently not excessively, but more frequently and some other things. And you can kind of suppress the, because we don't have any fungicides we would recommend for powdery mildew. All right, thank you, Rock. Lauren, you have one picture on this one. It's a great question. It comes to us from Parker, Colorado. Uh, in 23, they had five episodes of hail, uh, had a pear tree that was stripped of its leaves, then discovered the new apple tree next door had fire blight. The pear never had it. He treated the pear, fertilized, pruned, etc. But he's got these suckers. 
He would like to keep one to see if he has a pair, but he's really wondering, will that one get fire blight too? Because the big pair had fire blight. And it, it looks like there may be some fire blight even in the picture on uh, a couple of the suckers to the left of the better looking one. Uh, and yes, it will, it uh, will get fire blight. Most pears are susceptible. There are a few that are less susceptible. So if you keep that, uh, you will have it. I just recommend using sanitation and cleaning up as much as possible. And then anytime that you see fire blight starting, making sure that you're pruning that out. That's gonna be the best thing you can do. All right, thank you very much. You have three pictures on the first one. This comes to us from Sioux City. Uh, hollyhocks looked so good until a week ago, <laughs> and then they didn't, and it starts on the lower leaves. <laughs> that is beautiful right there. I, if I have a hollyhock, that's what I want it to look like right there. Uh, it's hollyhock rust, and hollyhock rust is unique because many of the rusts we talk about go through other hosts. So when we talk about cedar apple rust, for example, when we talk about the apple tree and the cedar cycle, with hollyhock rust, it just stays on hollyhock and it will overwinter in residue. So that's key for management. So you can do some residue control uh, in other years, uh, making sure you're cleaning your garden site up uh, of any debris, because that's where it will typically overwinter. And I'm guessing based on how much you have, you had hollyhocks here before or your neighbor across the fence did. So uh, that's the biggest thing. And then if you want to grow hollyhocks, most of the fungicides, if you want to try to control it, most of the fungicides on the homeowner market would, would do a, a decent job of managing hollyhock rust. So you could look for a general use uh, fungicide in the Mancozeb, uh, even chlorothalonil, any of these would have some activity on hollyhock rust. Early. Early, but Early. much earlier. Once you see it, it's too late. So if you see any spots at all developing, you really need to be treating even before that. All right. So it's too late now. <laughs> all right. Enjoy it, it's beautiful. Enjoy. Of course, says the pathologist. Yeah, why not? <laughs> All right, uh, Elizabeth, you have two pictures on this first one. This comes to us from Omaha. She uh, has discovered that uh, damage to the tomatoes and the grapes. She thinks it's herbicide overspray from an unknown source. Neighbor has the same thing on the other side of a fence. She did replace her tomato plants. She's concerned that everything else in the garden, in the vegetable garden, might be affected. Should she eat any of the vegetables and fruits that grow on them? And since the grapevine is perennial, how long will it be affected? Should she prune that back? So when it comes to herbicides um, in the garden, there is no pre-harvest interval from when they're applied to when it's safe to consume. So the most cautious we would be would be to remo remove any of those annual vegetable crops for sure that are showing those cl classic symptoms of that herbicide injury. Um, you know, we can deduce that there will be some breakdown of that herbicide with time, with sunlight, with water. Um, the hard part is, is we don't have an exact amount of herbicide that was applied, so we really don't have a good answer on when it is safe. So if they wanted to prune out those portions of the grape, they could, um, you know, especially those garden crops that are showing the symptoms of the herbicide injury, go ahead and take them out. Um, but the rest of the garden, we don't know if it had drift, if it didn't. Um, but if it's one of those that has a longer days till harvest, um, more than likely it will break down with sunlight and time and water. So uh, not an easy answer when it comes to any of this, not but exact. you know, for most cautious, it would be removal. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, your next one is, uh, he has a raised bed and uh, it's a kind of a fun little raised bed. He's, this is kind of a turf question, but not really, which is how many grass cuttings must he wait until he can use those clippings in his raised beds? He's trying to raise worms in them, he has mowed about four times since he put on fertilizer and everything else. He's trying to keep the bed as free of chemicals as he possibly can. So, Rock, I believe it is three mowings, correct? That's okay, correct. good. See, I pay attention to when Rock talks. <laughs> um, so we wait three mowings from when we make those applications before we use those in the garden. Um, if we're using some uh, other products, there are some times where we might have to wait six weeks before we use those clippings. So it can be products dependent. So be sure to read on that label um, or do some research to determine that. But in the worm bed, at least three mowings. So I'd say he's done four probably go ahead and use those grass clippings at this point in time. All right, are you ready, Elizabeth? I'm ready. 
Your first question is, this is a Shenandoah viewer. She planted five cucumber seeds in a saucer-sized space. She's wondering, should she thin them? And if she does, will she get more cukes? She will want to thin them, yes. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who wants to know, is there anything they can do to straighten a young tree that is leaning? Not really. Uh, if it has adequate amount of light, it should start to lean on its own. Otherwise, nothing you can really do. All right. We have a viewer who has oak seedlings, and he wants to know whether he can save them, dig them, put them in pots. Yes. Okay. Um, we have a viewer who is wondering whether he can crush up folic acid and potassium glutinate pills that are human pills, crush them, and then use them on his garden. I would say probably not because that's not what's on the label. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who uh, says their sycamores are not leaving out. This is in northeast Nebraska. Dead? <coughs> All we can do is water, watch, and wait. <laughs> All right. Nice job. <laughs> That one I haven't heard before. I'll write that one down. That one's my own. I trademarked it. <laughs> okay, are you ready, Lauren? Ready Maybe. To water, watch, and wait. <laughs> oh. Sure. Okay. We have uh, a viewer who has wilting branches in a maple tree. They think it might be verticillium wilt. Will pruning out those branches save the tree? No. Okay. A you could check that. You could cut it and see if there's any brown streaming or brown circles in the cambium underneath the bark. Okay. Uh, we have a Polk County viewer who wonders, is it okay to leave old pine needles under a tree year after year, or are there issues associated with disease? Uh, there can be if you have foliar diseases, but in general, a healthy pine trees, it's, there's nothing there for disease that's gonna be an issue. All right. Uh, we have an Elkhorn viewer whose tomatoes have curly tops on them. Uh, are they safe or is this a disease? Uh, if one of the tomato plants is affected like this, it could be a virus and I would rogue it out. If it's all the tomato plants, it could be herbicide injury like Elizabeth was talking about earlier. All right. We have a viewer who's wondering whether the same diseases that attack spruces would cause concolor fir to go into decline. Generally not. Um, there are some cankers, though, that could go across those different species. All right, nice yeah. job. Okay, are you ready, Rock? Like ready, Whip. <laughs> ready. Okay. <laughs> this is a Plattsmouth viewer who wonders whether it is okay to water at night, and this is both the, the garden and the lawn. The lawn is much better to water um, pre-dawn early morning or pre-dawn. Uh, you don't want it being watered late in the evening. I think this is probably true of most plants because of disease issues. All right. Uh, his follow-up question is, do rain showers at night do damage to the turf? No. Okay. We have a viewer who wants to know, uh, from Seward, who wants to know, is it safe to mulch the garden with clippings that are treated for weeds? Uh, after the third mowing, it certainly is. All right. Uh, we have a Council Bluffs viewer who wants to know, is there a natural or bio-friendly weed control for Creeping Charlie? Um, Fiesta is a, the brand name. It's a, actually a chelated iron form, and it'll burn it back, And but you just have to be multiple applications, probably up to five, before you're going to kill ground ivy. All right. This is a viewer who has pokeweed, uh, knows it's toxic, wants to know, can they put it in the compost after they get it out of their landscape? The heat, if they generate enough heat, it certainly will break down the... <laughs> constituents that make it poisonous, even though Lauren would argue that you should eat that stuff. Okay. Poke salad, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Even Paige. songs about eating poke salad. <laughs> it's a real thing. We don't want to hear it. Yeah. All right. Are you ready? Yes. This is a Plattsmouth viewer who is wondering about using neem oil for aphids, which we've recommended, on river birch and on the mulch and the perennials underneath the tree. Uh, if there's aphids on those, then sure. All right, uh, that same person is wondering how often you would use the neem oil. Um, neem oil you might want to reapply about every week. All right. Yeah. We have a Brownville viewer who has uh, large black ants have created mounds in his half acre landscape. They're not in the house. Are they an issue? Um, as long as they're not bothering anything, then 
if you're okay with it, they're okay with it. So, All right. Yeah. Uh, we have a northwest corner of Howard County viewer who has identified jumping worms, three per square feet. Is there a granular natural control? No, there is not. All right. Um, is there a soil treatment for raised beds that have been decimated by white flies and cabbage worms in the past? And if so, could you put that on before you replant? Not as a soil treatment, no. I, d I don't think I've heard of that, so no. All right, interesting questions from yes. ev for everybody this year. You all did a nice job, thank you very much. Well, we've got a special event this weekend that we'd like to invite you to. Um, so here's Terry out at the Backyard Farmer Garden to tell us more. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we are inviting you to come visit us this weekend for our first East Campus Discovery Days. We'll be here in the garden along with many of the master gardeners here to answer all of your questions from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. There'll be lots going on here on East Campus, food trucks, vendors, lots of things to be able to see and do and lots of different departments out here to kind of get your kiddos involved in some of those science activities that we all do here on campus. We'll have all of our plants out. You'll be able to visit, ask questions, and maybe get an idea or two for your own backyard. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden this Saturday for East Campus Discovery Day's open house from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Hope to see you there. That's this Saturday from 10 to 2 right here on East Campus. And, of course, it is time for Elizabeth to tell us about the beautiful plants of the week. Yes, we have some really nice plants of the week this week. And these plants, so we're going to start with the white one. Um, this is going to be a larkspur. Now, larkspurs have very finely dissect foliage back here. Kind of looks a little bit like dill. Um, it also has the white flowers. It could be purple. It could be pink. Um, it's an annual, so it comes up from seed. It can reseed itself readily. Comes in, like I said, lots of different colors. Uh, flower spikes will be anywhere from from two to three feet, or like this year, four feet. Um, it has a lot of height to it. Attracts pollinators, um, a really fun plant. And like I said, it's an easy one to start from seed. Uh, the other one is gonna be the yellow one. The yellow one is one of my favorite scientific names to say because it's Zizia, um, mm -hmm. also known as Golden Alexander. Um, so this is outgrowing in the backyard farmer garden rain chain, um, but so it can handle some of those wet, dry kind of environments, uh, likes it a little bit wet, it attracts a wide range of pollinators, and then also it will also seed itself about two to three foot tall, and this year Kim says that it's flowering again. So normally we only have one flush of flowers, but the viewers get to see both the seeds and the flowers on one plant this week. So some really fun plants that will spread by seed in your garden. Excellent, thank you, Elizabeth. And the purple matches your shirt. <laughs> All right, uh, we have some announcements, of course, of fun things in the gardening world. And our very first one is, yet again, East Campus Discovery Days on the mall. There's all sorts of stuff, but of course you must come to the Backyard Farmer Garden. Um, Backyard Farmer, uh, the Lincoln Garden Club free garden tour, uh, Saturday, June 8th from 9 a.m. to uh, 12 p.m. There are four locations. Uh, you can start at any of them. There is an email if you want more information about that one. And I think then our very last one is us again, Backyard Farmer Live at Hastings College. Monday, June 10th, we uh, go live at six, come at five on the library green and ask us all your questions. All right, uh, so talking about questions, we have Kate, one picture on this first one. All he's saying is good bugs are bad. This is on his cone flowers. Yeah, these are good bugs. These are the caterpillars of the checker spot butterfly. Um, so if you're willing to sacrifice those plants, I would absolutely leave those caterpillars there because they're going to be beautiful pollinators. All right. Uh, you have one picture on this one. Uh, has, she has, uh, uh, this is Fairberry, has never had this in onions before and she's wondering whether she can spray seven on the whole patch so they don't spread. 
Yeah, so these are not beautiful butterflies. These are most likely some of the armyworms, possibly the bee armyworm. Um, in this case, since the caterpillars are still relatively small, I wouldn't use seven. I would look for a product that has Bacillus thuringiensis or BTK in it. That works really well for caterpillars. Um, so I would go ahead and start with that one and give that product a try. All right, and one pick on this one. And uh, <laughs> she's wondering what should she do, if anything, about this little guy that has be been eating holes in the sedum plants. And we had two or three people send this this week. So that's really interesting. This is a looper. Um, it looks really similar to a cabbage looper, but it's obviously on sedum. Um, if the caterpillars are big enough and you can see them like you can in this picture, the easiest thing that's going to be you're going to be able to do is to hand pick them off, um, feed some birds, throw it into soapy water. But um, if you do use a product, just make sure sedums on the label, and of course you want to be cognizant of those flowers and avoid applying anything while the sedums are flowering. All right, thank you, Kate. Two pictures on the first one uh, for you, Rock. This comes to us from Colorado. These grow in the garden. She uh, let them go to see what they were. She thought they were garlic. They don't get cloves. The leaves are flat, not tubular. They smell like garlic. What are they? Are they edible and are they killable? <laughs> so wild garlic and wild onion are often confused. Wild garlic has a hollow stem and not a flattened stem like this one. So I'm gonna say this is a wild onion. Yes, it is edible and actually every portion of it is edible and it can be used in salads, you know, fresh and as a seasoning like an onion would be as, as well. Um, and also the onion branches from the base, whereas wild garlic branches along the stem. So that's how we tell them apart uh, because that doesn't have a hollow stem. It's uh, probably wild onion. And you kill it if she wants to kill it. How? If you want to kill it, there's a fair amount. Phenoxy herbicides that are used to control broadleaf weeds work moderately well in a landscape bed, grass be gone. Um, as long as it's labeled for whatever else you have in there, actually does a reasonably good job. And most of the sedge herbicides will also work on wild onion and wild garlic. All right, thank you. Three picks on the next one. Um, this is actually comes to us from Magnolia. And uh, she has all these, <clears throat> excuse me, these little grasses coming up in the second year grapes between the asparagus under the cherry tree. She's wondering whether she can spray grass be gone on the wood chips. Okay, so Grass Be Gone is a, na a name of a herbicide, the Ortho Company, it's a brand name. Uh, there's Grass Getter and others, and most of them are Fusillate or Philazophop, not important to everyone in the room, um, except that some things that are labeled for edibles, for ornamental, they're all labeled for ornamentals and you don't have any problem with Grass Be Gone. But, but Grass Be Gone, depending upon what label you get and where you live, is labeled for edibles and, and there's a whole instructions on what to do. So if she's got the right product, certainly she's well within the confines of restrictions. Um, and will it kill the grasses? Yeah, as long as you follow directions. But let's just make sure that you have the properly labeled product for the, uh, tar the weed target and the weed location. Excellent, thank you. Two pictures on the first <clears throat> one. Uh, Lauren comes to us from Hooper. Oh, Rock, I'm sorry, you've got one more question. So your next question <coughs> is a reminder here. This is somebody who has this clover, micro clover in it and wants to get rid of it, not keep it. Yeah, uh, that's interesting because most, you know, earlier we had somebody that wanted to keep right. it, right? And I believe they said they used a herbicide labeled. My concern is, is that they used it three times and they still didn't get it. So right. I'm guessing that maybe they didn't have the label correct. Um, and go back and check because, you know, it probably was labeled for 5,000 square feet and they have a 15,000 square foot lawn. I'm not saying that for sure, but it, that product generally works as long as they follow directions. And one of the directions with that granular herbicide on broadleaf weeds is to make sure you wet the surface before you put the, her, the herbicide. It's two herbicides and fertilizer. So you want the surface to be wet. So if they didn't wet the surface, that may be why the efficacy went down dramatically, or if they don't didn't calculate their area correctly, it may have gone down too light. But that product should work great on on uh, micro clover or any of the clovers. But if they're still concerned about it, I would get a ready to use broadleaf herbicide and spot spray those areas they want to go after. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, now it's your turn, Lauren. This is still hooper. This is still the tops of tomato plants, and they're still <laughs> turning gray. So what's going on? Yeah, on, on these. Um, when, when we see the, the terminal growth dying, the way this looks, uh, the gray, I, I think it, I'm interpreting it as death. And if they're seeing that on just an occasional plant, not all the plants, which it wasn't clear, I don't think in the question, Kim, 
Right. Um, that, that's very likely to be a virus. So uh, some of our viruses will cause terminal death. And so if you see those, uh, I would recommend roguing those plants out. Right. Now, if it's all the plants in your garden and they're different varieties and everything, then we've got another issue and I would suggest send us a sample. All right, thank you, Lauren. You have uh, three picks on this one. I think this is more yours than Kate's, mm. but they're cukes, so mm. between the two of you can figure this out. Uh, she wants to know what is going on with these plants about halfway through the season every year they do this, what's happening and how can, how can it be prevented? Um, and some of the things you can see in the previous picture, you can see the, the lighter spots, smaller size varying in size. On the older leaves, we're seeing larger spots with this shot hole appearance where the, the lesion actually falls mm -hmm. out. Um, this is a symptom that we see with anthracnose on cucumbers, uh, and I believe that's probably what it is, uh, particularly where they say it's happening every year. Um, this is something that would be in the residue, so after this year, you have enough of it, it's gonna be really hard to manage at this point, but try to use sanitation in the future. Um, if you have an opportunity to grow your cucumbers somewhere else or rotate location a little bit, that will help as well. Uh, but this is a fungal disease that is overwintering in the residue, most likely. All right, uh, and Kate's nodding her head, so yes. it was yours. Yeah. And you have one more picture. Uh, wondering what is wrong with his columbine. He has another one 15 feet away that is fine. And this is one I, I couldn't really tell it was columbine until reading the question, because it's so wilty, right? Right. Uh, and if we look closely at this, there's some leaves that are dying on the bottom of the plant. Uh, so a, a few things with, anytime we see an ornamental plant where we've got dead leaves at the base, it's most likely some sort of crown and root rot and then it's wilting so we know the root system's been compromised. Um, I, I would say in this case, you're, you're not gonna do anything to save this plant probably, but um, the reality is look at where it's at, if there's some sort of overwandering, if this was a plant that was purchased from seed, that it's, it may be planted too deep the way it looked in the picture as well. All right, thanks Lauren. Two picks for you on the first one, Elizabeth. Uh, this comes to us from Elkhorn. They're saying their spinach typically does well. This year it isn't growing. Stunted yellow leaves, compost, and vegetable fertilizer were added when it was planted three to four weeks ago. So we could be having some kind of carryover in the compost. I know I've heard of, of that happening, um, but also it's been kind of warm. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we take a look, a lot of the yellowing of the leaves is the older most leaves. And so I'm thinking we're looking at something environmental um, where we're looking at the temperatures or what's causing the, the yellowing on that. So you could pick them off, um, but you know, before long, it's gonna be too hot for spinach anyway. All right, one picture on the next one. Uh, Similar, this comes to us from Gretna. What is happening to the leaves of the pea plants in the backyard farmer garden? Same. Or not thing. their garden, but our not garden, their but garden. Theirs, yeah. ours too. <laughs> yes, and, and that's going to happen across the state. Um, as we start to get warmer, the peas are going to start to be on decline. Um, so it's just one of those things where those warmer temperatures and those cool season crops, um, they're ending their life cycle. Just remember, you can do a fall garden with some of those cool season crops again once we get to July and August. All right, and one picture on the next one. She wants to know if she can prune the sides of her spruce trees. If so much, how can it be taken back and will it hurt the tree? Technically, yes, you can cut the spruce tree, but it hurts my heart to tell you that. <laughs> Um, because the spruce tree looks gorgeous all the way down to the ground. Um, normally we um, don't recommend uh, cutting more than one third of the canopy off at any one point in time. Um, you can kind of do selective feather cutting or feather pruning to kind of take some of those growth points off if you're worried about it being too close to the house. Now the thing to keep in mind, you're gonna to have to remove those candles every year while it puts new ones on to keep it to a smaller size. If you're looking at limbing it up, um, we wanna make sure if we make cuts back onto the wood that has no needles that we're gonna just take it all the way back to the trunk. We're not gonna leave those nubs out there. So you can prune it, but I think it looks gorgeous right now. All right, thanks Elizabeth. Well, we did have a little mix up of our video features earlier. Now we're going to be able to show you that unique bog filter in David Holding's backyard. I've always wanted to do a pond. I knew it was a big undertaking, un undertaking especially as I was going to planning to do the whole thing myself. So last, a bit late on in the season, last September, after I got back from a trip to China, I started digging away. Dug, um, this, so this is all clay soil. It took quite a, 
quite a while to get it dug out. And the, the raised area you see at the back is all the spoils from that. So it's about three and a half feet deep in its deepest point and about two feet deep at the front. Um, it's covered with a, has a plastic liner that I've done my best to cover up with boulders. So one of the things that with a, with a pond is that you need to get, get the nitrogen out of the water and you have a lot of runoff from, from the grass from around and the surrounding gardens. And so you need to get the nitrogen off and the best way to do that um, if you don't want to use chemicals is to have as many plants as you can get. So that's why you see all the um, aquatic plants that are coming on. I've got the lilies coming on and the water hyacinth, various other things. And you can see I'm experimenting with some vegetables on a floating raft. So I thought, why not? They're a lot cheaper than, than aquatic plants and they do a great job of sucking out the nitrogen. Um, the fish like hanging out underneath there. Um, and the water's got clearer and clearer, which is, so it seems to be working. And that's in part due to the bog filter that I've installed at the back. I needed aeration in the water, otherwise it was just going to be a, a stagnant swamp. And I thought that the, the stream with the, with the rocks would be sufficient for that aeration. But after some time this spring, I realized I was going to need something in addition. And so I looked into bog filters and the principle behind that. What a bog filter is, is, is an area of, of a certain percentage of the volume of your pond which has gravel in it, pea gravel, it has to be a fairly small grade of gravel and the water gets circulated up very, quite slowly through that gravel and you have plants, aquatic plants that don't mind being submerged in the top of the gravel. You have bacteria and other microbes growing in, um, surviving in the, in the gravel and they take out the nitrogen, they purify the water and the plants that are in the top also take out the nitrogen and what comes out of the top of the bog filter is more clear water than went through. So you need to have a certain percentage of your flow going through the bog filter. So I have a, I have a pump that's in, the, that's in the pond, it pumps one gallon per second. Uh, it goes up to a main pipe and then the, I split the pipe into two adjustable valves. So I can regulate the flow between the main stream and, that, and the, the pipe that goes through the filter. And the idea is that you want to find your sweet spot. You don't want the water to go through the bog filter too fast. Otherwise the bacteria can't do their job. And you don't want to go through it too slowly because then it becomes stagnant and you have mosquitoes and all the rest of it. So I'm just now getting that sweet, finding that sweet spot. And it's just basically a slow trickle through the main filter and then out into the sub filter. Thank you so much to David for allowing us to check out that really wonderful pond and that innovative technology to keep it clean. That's pretty cool. All right, Kate, two pictures on the first one here. Uh, she is wondering uh, what is going on with her Bristol black raspberry patch. She's, she's seen little white flying insects. She sprayed with seven. It's an old patch and she's in Gretna. So these are actually aphids and those little white flying things are the aphid exoskeletons because they shed their exoskeleton as they grow. So you've had a lot of aphids probably for a while. Um, take a strong stream of water and try to get that daily. Otherwise you can use a product like insecticidal soap. All right, uh, you have one picture on this next one. Comes to us from Lincoln. What is this guy? This is a red bud borer beetle. Beautiful to look at, probably not so great if you have red buds so. though. Oh boy, okay. Uh, one picture on the next one also. Found this caterpillar, this is Omaha, camouflages very well. What is it and is it helpful or harmful? I really love this picture. I'm so <laughs> glad they were able to spot it. Um, this is the caterpillar of an underwing moth. Um, as their name suggests, they're kind of like a drab brown moth, but their hind wings are these beautiful orange or yellow colors. So really great find. Awesome, excellent. All right, uh, Rock, your first one here is um, from Hastings. What plant is this and how to kill it if it's not a keeper? Uh, this is burdock. I'm pretty confident this is burdock, um, which is a biennial. Um, it needs to be taken be long before it flowers, which is gonna, I wouldn't even, I think that's my, this might be the year, hard to say from just looking at it. Um, but it, it's a knot want and certainly it can be hand dug. Um, it's in a landscape bed, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's not really much you can do except spot spray with, a, with something like glyphosate or hand dig it. 
All right. Uh, your next one comes to us from <coughs> Omaha, and this is, uh, she's saying this weed in the sedum is impossible to pull, taking over her flower bed. Yeah, this looks like wild onion. We mentioned it earlier. Um, in the sedum bed, grass be gone um, would be recommended. All right, so same thing as before. And mm -hmm. I think you have one more picture. And this one uh, comes to us from Lincoln. This was a tree that was removed in April and it was reseeded. This is what it looks like after almost two <coughs> months. Will it ever match the other turf? I, you know, this is an interesting question because, you know, I could kind of see the mound and it sounds like they probably ground the stump. Um, that's going to be a great place for fairy ring in the next couple of years. But <laughs> that aside, I, I just don't think they got very good seed distribution and they just need to throw some seed back over the top. A little late in the season to be doing that now, but um, I think <coughs> they just need to reseed that and, and be persistent in that. I just don't think they got a good take of their seed initially. All right, thank you, Rock. Uh, you have one picture on this first one, and uh, she knows what it is, <clears throat> and we know what it is. We've never seen it like this. She says it's a great example of fasciation. What is fasciation, Lauren? That's, that's just beautiful. I've never seen one like this, but it, it's basically the distorted growth of, of stem tissue that in the meristematic tissue as it develops when it's going through a lot of times cold and hot cycles early in the year. So I don't know. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. All right, and you have uh, three picks on this next one, and um, she comes to us, uh, these come to us from Sutton. We've got some dying branches. We've got some interior shots here. They want to know if there's anything they can do to prevent this uh, from happening. And, and on these pictures, you can see some pitch on the stems, and, and this is an example of, of some canker injury, and, and what I would recommend in this case is go back about three to five inches from any of the branches in those areas with pitch on them where the canker is. It, it could likely be cytospora canker, and just prune that out. All right, thank you, Lauren. One pick uh, on your first one here, Elizabeth, comes to us from Blair, severe storm. The living fence of Forsythia was squashed four to five feet in height originally. Their question is, will it fill in? Can they do anything, or should they cut their losses and start over? I'd give it a good haircut. Um, take it back about uh, two feet to 18 inches tall. Uh, make sure to take anything broken off and give it a good haircut and it'll come right back. All right, two picks on the next one. Uh, this is a Lincoln viewer. They want an ID on this tree, but they mostly wonder, is it healthy and should it <clears throat> come down? It doesn't matter what it is because you need to take it down. <laughs> before it falls on the house. Before it falls on the house. It's deeming almost a hazard right now. <laughs> exactly. All right, and then you have one picture on the next one. And this is really a follow-up question. Uh, he's sent this earlier in the season. This is an autumn blaze maple. He's saying that now this crack on the trunk has gotten even worse. He's wondering, is this, is this a savable thing or is this a treatable thing <clears throat> or is this a start over? All we can really do, like I said before, is water, watch, and wait. Um, you know, we are going to see if it closes back up, if it gets that callus tissue in that area. I wasn't seeing much of a root flare, so it could be something related to why we don't have that root <coughs> flare too. Right, exactly. And it's an autumn blaze maple, so <laughs> maybe we could get a different one. 